ready like never. No time like the present. <clears throat> Hi and welcome. My name is Caroline Rose. I am a senior analyst and the head of the Strategic Vacuums Program here at New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy. Today we are going to be discussing Pakistan at a geopolitical crossroads. Uh, welcome to our viewers and our listeners. Uh, this is going to be a very fascinating discussion and I really cannot think of a better lineup and a better guest to have today um, than uh, Mosharraf Zaidi. Uh, today we're going to discuss a very important topic uh, that is impacting South Asian security and is of great interest to a U.S. policymaking audience. Uh, we're going to explore Pakistan's evolving drivers of state behavior, both domestic and foreign. We're going to explore some of the constraints and the imperatives that uh, really shape state behavior and its foreign policy decision-making apparatus. And so there's, of course, a lot to talk about today. We've got a very full plate uh, for discussion and uh, particularly within the context of U.S. interest and within the context of Indian Ocean security and Pakistani security. Uh, but I do, I do want to talk a bit about our guests. Um, I am joined by my colleague, Kamran, uh, Dr. Kamran Bukhari, uh, the director of our analytical development uh, uh, program, and uh, he's going to be joining me in leading today's discussion. Uh, but I also want to talk about our guests that we are very honored to have today. Um, Mosharraf Zaidi. Uh, he is a leading analyst. He's a leading thinker and foreign policy practitioner. Uh, he is currently a senior fellow at Ted, uh, Tadab Lab, uh, sorry, Tabad Lab um, with experience in educational policy, state building, development, aid, and of course, foreign policy. And until 2013, he was the principal advisor to Pakistan's foreign minister. So thank you again for being here and thank you for joining us here at New Lines. We're very excited to have you um, and I'm very interested to see, uh, you know, to pick your brain and see what you think about uh, Pakistan's evolving foreign policy and geopolitics. Honored to be here, Caroline. Thank you for the very generous introduction and, uh, and excited to be uh, with the New Lines folks. Uh, exciting new think tank uh, that uh, I and many friends and colleagues follow really closely. Uh, so great to be here. Thank you for the invitation to both of you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, a lot to unpack today, uh, but let's start a bit with framing where Pakistan is in the regional geopolitical landscape and the security landscape. Pakistan, of course, is surrounded by great powers uh, and great powers that are changing their behavior in South Asia and in the Indian Ocean and in Central Asia. Uh, of course, uh, Pakistan has to uh, situate itself with China, with India, with Iran, and then of course its ongoing alliance with the United States and some of the allies in the, in the region. And so while of course Pakistan has agency, it also deals with a number of constraints that affect its foreign policy. Uh, and I want to kind of dig into some of that. What, what shrouds the consensus and the decision-making process within Pakistan? Uh, what kind of constraints, domestic and foreign constraints, really affect that decision-making process? You know, you look at right now, even within the past year or so, Pakistan has made itself a very assertive actor in trying to define and redefine its foreign policy. It has come to the table with U.S. Taliban uh, negotiations. It is offered to mediate U.S.-Iran. Uh, talks. It's also offered to mediate Saudi Arabian and U.S. or Saudi Arabian and Iranian uh, mediation efforts, and so it's really trying to assert itself as a um, an intermediary in the region, but at the same time assert its foreign policy. But at the same time, it's got a number of constraints. Its economy, of course, is lagging. Um, there is a lack of consensus, uh, at, sometimes at the most, the most basic level in its foreign policy decision-making process. And the role of the military is also something to be looked at as well when deciding foreign policy and even domestic policy measures. So can you kind of walk us through some of the constraints and imperatives that Pakistan is dealing with when approaching foreign policy? Sure. I, I didn't know that this was a 24-hour marathon, but now that I do, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, let, let me start. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I think that uh, we're all trying to understand how these things work in 
in a wider uh, global context, and and I know that here at Newslines as well, uh, Newlines as well, you guys are thinking about this idea of agency. I really liked, you know, and all your fr the whole framing is great, but but the you use the word agency that Pakistan has agency, and and I think for me, the core question in how to think about this is how much agency does Pakistan have? Uh, the best example of this question of agency is, oh, we got to get Pakistan to do more with respect to the Taliban in Afghanistan. And, you know, the assumption there is that Pakistan has borderline infinite agency, unlimited agency, and can tell the Taliban to do what it wants, and the Taliban will do it. Um, this is also a country in which for almost a decade, uh, people, markets, school children, women, uh, you know, innocent people were getting blown up. Um, and some of the critics, just to give you kind of the spectrum of what the country uh, represents to various audiences, including people within the country. You know, there were some folks who went as far as to say that even those, you know, the, the, the suffering of terrorism that Pakistan went through for almost a decade was you know, really, is it really Pakistan suffering? Didn't, aren't these monsters the creation of Pakistan itself? And is it, isn't Pakistan just capable of turning off the switch when it wants? And of course, we went through a war, 50, 60, 70,000, depending on which estimates you use, um, the economy completely, uh, you know, destroyed. And I think more importantly, state capacity reduced to what it is, where, where you see Pakistan struggling to be able to get a few things done. And then immediately you hear from friends in the US and say, hey man, you know, struggling state structure, you know, don't you know it? And and I think the reason I bring all this up is then, then I look at Joe Biden coming in and gangbusters deciding, you know what, we're gonna vaccinate some people here and hitting the target for 100 days in 58 days and then doubling the target coming in with a stimulus that everybody thought was way too much and was way leftist and getting it done. And so, and, and this is not a person who uses extreme language, you know, whether it's Biden himself or the administration. And that makes me think, well, actually, this idea of agency is genuinely contestable and deserves to be challenged by a country's leadership. So at the end of the day, I think Pakistan has virtually as much agency as its leadership decides is worth having for its political interests. You've had, you had a, I think, Obama too, and, and Trump won. This is very controversial to say, but they both also had agency. And in many ways, whether it was the second term of Obama or, or the one term uh, of uh, President Trump, America, in in, a, in essence, ceded a lot of its agency at home and abroad. Um, I think if you look at China, China has the agency to choose to not engage in the kind of highly, um, highly aggressive rhetoric, uh, which it feels it needs to engage in as a response to, you know, what it sees as U.S. aggression. So you... I think in any given scenario, countries have a lot of agency, and I think that we're still in an era where the Westphalian state is actually the ultimate instrument of getting stuff done. So my top line for Pakistan is it's a country of unlimited potential with, I think, the most beautiful, generous, warm, amazing people on the planet with due respect to the country I'm in. You guys are second best. <laughs> um, I say that everywhere I go. Uh, but, uh, but, but you know, it's, it's really, it, it really has an opportunity to be as or even more amazing than its founders imagined. And whether it'll get there or not is really a challenge for the Pakistani elite or what we call leadership. Uh, that, that's my top line. So continuing on that strategic sort of angle, uh, we're looking at multiple crosswinds. Yeah. And Pakistan is in the middle. Uh, last year, we did a panel at 
new lines uh, on the topic of Pakistan being the most sandwiched country between the Chinese and the Americans. Uh, on the western border, there's Afghanistan, a 40-year-old war, uh, and everybody's aware of the history. And But what's more important is what's going to happen once the U.S. formally pulls out. What is the impact for Pakistan? What is Pakistan's plans to dealing with that impact? There's already uh, the relationship between India and Pakistan that hit, that hit rock bottom two years ago. Uh, for the first time since the 71 war, we had aircraft being used by both sides to strike at each other. Uh, things have not been that bad in, in many, many years. Although, more recently, in all fairness, we have a back-channel conversation going on, and we'll see where that goes. Um, there is the U.S. Uh, alignment with India. There is the U.S. negotiations with Iran. And now we have the China-Iran deal as well. Pakistan is in the middle of all of this. How do you read it from Islamabad? Well, I, I think first I, I, I would, I, would uh, I admire that that framing, right? I, I think it's exactly right. Um, Pakistan is not just sandwiched between the U.S. and China. Pakistan is ensconced. Um, it's in a cul-de-sac uh, of strategic challenges. Um, but I think it's also in a cul-de-sac of strategic opportunities. Yes, Pakistan is sandwiched between the sandwich between the U.S. and China, and absolutely, the U.S. in particular makes some really ridiculous demands and treats Pakistan um, at, you know, at, in in ways that are really confusing, uh, utterly. Uh, the most recent example is is the climate summit, um, you know, invites that went out earlier this week, or late last week. You know, this is the most climate vulnerable country on the planet, possibly, certainly top five. It's also one of the lowest emitters. It is actually a poster child for what could be done with climate. And we have an administration who I'm, as you know, no fan of, but an administration led by a man who is personally committed um, in, in the public domain on, on climate. And yet, you know, this snub is clearly about not doing enough with the Taliban. That That's really the only agenda point the U.S. has. So the U.S., I think, has adopted some some difficult and, and sometimes unreasonable positions with Pakistan. Um, to be honest, I can't say that China does the same to Pakistan because it doesn't. Um, but, but I do think that China, being China, poses some very hard challenges for Pakistan to parse through. But I'd say that you know, the notion that Pakistan is somehow unique in being sandwiched between these two countries needs to be unpacked as well. What about Vietnam? What about Singapore? What about Malaysia? What about Indonesia? What about any of the RCEP countries? Right? I, I think that Pakistan needs to figure out a way in which its strategic and defense relationship with China and the U.S., can be maintained whilst deepening its economic partnership with China and with the US. This is something that several other countries have done before. Will it be more challenging for Pakistan? Yes, it will. Partly because of Pakistan's own strategic culture, partly because internally Pakistan, I mean, you, you pointed at this earlier and, and I, I'd go a little bit deeper. You know, this this whole notion of civil military, that of course that's, that's the big picture contest, but Underneath that, there's there's more problematic divisions. The capacity of the Pakistani foreign office and the wider Pakistani bureaucracy versus the kind of power that they hold versus the kind of power that military officers hold and their capacity to engage in geopolitics or geoeconomics versus the Ministry of Commerce, the Board of Investment, and the Ministry of Finance, which are vital instruments in doing what Pakistan wants to do. How are we gonna put these three sort of broad entities into a blender and get a milkshake that gets Pakistan the nutrients it needs to be geoeconomically flexing the way that it wants to? Big question. Uh, the Pakistan-India question, I think is the one area where personally all the agency is with India and yet all the actions are are, are demanded of and offered by Pakistan. 
somebody recently asked me what I thought of the olive, olive branch or the olive tree that's been extended by General Bajwa and Prime Minister Khan to India in these track two talks, or not track two, rather back channel talks. And I said, first, I'd correct you. This is not an olive branch and it's not an olive tree. This is General Bajwa picking up and throwing the entire orchard uh, at the feet of India. And I can tell you what I predict will be the outcome, which is not much. India does not feel that it needs to do anything to prove itself in any arena, many thanks to the U.S. And so India will continue to do what it's doing in Kashmir and at home without any real international sort of challengers. And Pakistan's adoption of the role of that challenger, if it cedes that role, it will have to contend with domestic fallout. Um, when that manifests itself and how, we don't know. Um, there is an injustice in occupied Kashmir that you know has to be addressed. And if India is not willing to do it itself, other countries need to step up. And the only country that does is Pakistan. Um, the way that it's done it in the past, not ideal, certainly. But to capitulate or pretend that the Kashmir problem doesn't exist would be uh, morally and strategically not something that Pakistan can, can do for very long. Um, with Iran, Iran is an expansionist, revolutionary state. It's by very definition of what the Islamic Republic of Iran is, it needs to expand. And that's why you find Iranian footprint and, and fingerprints across the entire region. One of the big victims of Iran's external sort of, you know, uh, the lightest way to put it is playfulness, but it's not. It costs lives and it destroys communities. Uh, but one of the, the most profound victims of, of that behavior is, is Pakistan. Um, and then the one that you didn't talk about, but, but I know is part of the framing and, and we'll talk a lot about is Afghanistan. I think Afghanistan is the most important country um, in the world for, for Pakistan. There cannot be a peaceful, coherent, and economically viable Pakistan if Afghanistan is at war, and frankly, if Afghanistan is ruled by groups like the Taliban. So at the end of the day, all of these challenges are Pakistan's to face, but I would I would end where I started. Each one of these represents an opportunity. What if Pakistan can forge a working relationship with the Ayatollahs in, in Tehran and Mashhad? What if Pakistan could forge a consensus for peace and prosperity amongst Afghan leaders, including the Taliban, that creates an end to war? I don't know what peace looks like in Afghanistan, but right now we don't even know what the end to war looks like because it's been 40 years of war. What if? What if Pakistan can continue to deepen its relationship with China, mutual trust, deep cooperation in the military and strategic affairs, but also start exporting 10 times, 25 times, 50 times what it exports to China today? That's the real conversation Pakistani strategists should be having with China. And what if Pakistan can convince the Indian people that the path that they're on in terms of their support for a group like the BJP will eventually lead to some kind of conflict because of Kashmir and because of Pakistan's Muslim character and, and India's polity and, and its, frankly, hatred-driven agenda as far as Muslims are concerned. What if? So on all four of these fronts, there are these what ifs. And in each one of them, the positive response to each what if is an asset for the world community, but especially for Washington, D.C. Pakistan can be a pump primer, uh, it can be a catalyzer, it can be the enzyme that actually enables this array of neighbors to be better versions of themselves and in the bargain benefit tremendously from the economic, social and political stability and uh, opportunities that, that that kind of process would offer. I like the frame catalyzer like that's that's really interesting and I think it also very much explains how Pakistan has been not only just assertive and it's not necessarily ambitious but they have been really going for it with a lot of mediation efforts and it and it makes sense if you look at the constraints 
and the geopolitical and security landscape around because it's very important that they look to Afghanistan, they look to India, they look to the Indian Ocean and try and incrementally build a structure in which they can act within instead of trying to reposition itself uh, kind of in a reactionary ad hoc uh, way and, and you know, respond to some of these security threats. And that leads me to another question, and it's something that you know, I've been grappling with in my research, and I know many other people who've watched and come on as well. Uh, you know, there's now a larger focus uh, it, with the region. Um, you know, South and Central Asia, it's becoming far more important uh, for a US policy audience to counter China and to counter other great powers. We're starting to see the quadrilateral, quadrilateral uh, security dialogue emerge as a huge player in the Indian Ocean. And Pakistan is weighing uh, and considering how it will play this game. And there hasn't really been a definition of the Quad Alliance itself. There's a lot of discussion of whether the Quad will be you know, a hard alliance or a soft alliance and how it will incorporate regional players, how it will relate to Pakistan, how it will relate to China itself, uh, and how, of course, it will militarize the Indian Ocean. How do you see Pakistan, uh, you know, I don't want to say playing this game, but how do you see them interacting with the Quad? And particularly as they try and balance the U.S. relationship, because from a U.S. perspective, uh, it's not necessarily black and white as in it's either the Quad or it's Pakistan or, you know, we have to weigh China a certain way. But how will, how should the U.S. counterbalance China with Pakistan while also trying to either incorporate it into the Quad Alliance or collaborate with Pakistan and the Quad, the quad Alliance at the same time? Because uh, there's a really interesting balancing act to be, to be really played in the Indian Ocean. Uh, look, I think, um... If we dispense with the assumption that there's something necessarily evil about either the U.S. or China, we can, I, I don't see why we can't surmise that Pakistan can be the one country where these two great powers come together to help shore up some of Pakistan's own limitations and, and the principal limitation Pakistan has, and it really doesn't have that many others because all the other ones are a product of this, the first one, and that is the economy. Without Pakistan growing dramatically pretty soon and sustainably, uh, the conversation I'm having and the framing of opportunity, uh, all of this is, is is a pipe dream. Pakistan needs to be able to pay its own bills. And in order to do that, it needs for its products and services and people to be roughly mobile. And in the, you know, I think what COVID-19 has done, it's really exposed the limitations of a lot of countries, including the US and, you know, um, all of Europe. But, but it's also shown us the potential um, of what digital tools give us, you know, the ability to move rapidly, uh, instantaneously across continents, what that does for, for example, for Pakistani IT freelancers and service providers. Um, Pakistan, I think, has, again, uh, a lot to offer. Specific, I think people want to know, are there examples of Pakistan serving as this unifying or collaborative um, or cohering uh, function. And I think there was a, I think the best example is the Amman 21 exercise that took place uh, just earlier this year in I think late January, early Feb. Uh, so the Indian Ocean of course is the Indian Ocean, but Pakistan's part of the Indian Ocean we, we call the Arabian Sea. Um, I'm sure that has nothing to do with the word India. Um, and and the Arabian Sea actually is a theater that gets that doesn't get talked about enough, but it's also one of the interesting theaters in which the maritime um, uh, force multiplier principle that the U.S. kind of adheres to uh, in that region, um, Pakistan is a key and vital partner in in that in that uh, in that principle, and so for the last 
almost two decades, uh, especially after 9-11, the Pakistan-U.S. partnership um, in the Arabian Sea is actually maybe stronger than even the military and the intelligence cooperation on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Um, so whilst AFPAC, you know, has a lot of critics, and, and there is no AFPAC, there's Afghanistan and there's Pakistan, and I think dispensing with that term is valuable. But what that terminology and that framing and that operational uh, structure within the U.S. did is that it created the space for a dramatically enhanced naval and maritime partnership. The reason I mention this is that the Quad can the Quad should do what the Quad needs to do. I don't think it's smart to try and counter China militarily when China's sort of full-fledged attack on the West or on democracies, which again, you know, I'm, that's in a sense that's American terminology uh, that that I don't adhere to. But but the attack or the the challenge is economic, and if the response is you know strategic or military. Uh, I, again, I, I understand the logic of it, but, but I think Americans probably need to step back and think more deeply about what they're doing. As far as Pakistan is concerned, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, the Americans and, and the Quad formulation is going to do what it's going to do, uh, and China is going to do what China is going to do. But even in that very tight sort of you know place between Iraq and, and, and the Quad, actually, there's opportunity. Um, the Amman 21 exercise, the example that I gave, is really interesting. It's the first time in, I think, nearly two decades that Russia, the U.S., and China were in the same naval exercise. What, what does that mean? Well, one, it means that the Americans, the Russians, and the Chinese want to work together. Where there's space to work together, they'll find that space and, and use it. If Pakistan becomes the convener and the organizer of that space, I think there's huge opportunities uh, to deepen that. And I think what we saw with the Moscow meeting um, related to the Afghan peace process is another example. Um, I think, you know, there, there's there's a whole host of other opportunities, including eventually in areas like artificial intelligence and 5G and the Internet of Things, where regulating for some of this stuff will require the capacity to convene partners that otherwise wouldn't be able to talk to each other in a, in a bilateral setting. So, mm -hmm. so we don't have to have repeats of Anchorage, Alaska. We can have a country like Pakistan in the room. Um, and and it's, I, I think I, I agree with you. It's not ambitious. Mm -hmm. This is not about assertiveness or ambition or kind of Pakistan thinking that, you know, being bigger than its shoes allows it to be. No, it is a matter of Pakistan's strategic survival and prosperity for it to be able to get these big powers and medium powers, Iran and Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. to talk to each other enough so that the blood from their fights doesn't pour on the streets of Pakistan. And that's really what the ultimately what, what strategy is about. It's about protecting yourself from the worst case scenario. I want to ask you, I want to go back to what you said about Pakistan being the enzyme, the catalyst. And the biggest question that one asks is, uh, sitting in Washington, is why isn't why hasn't it happened until now? And what's the holdup? We, we all know we can go through those, but I would like you to walk us through uh, sort of in a sequence of what you see are the arresters in that path towards Pakistan, playing that kind of role, exercising the agency that you talked about. And I would like you to pick apart that sort of decision to not exercise agency that you alluded to? Yeah, I think, like with any country, all of these external dimensions, let's start with, you know, this quite, I think, I like this framing. Let's start with Iran, Afghanistan, China, and India, and we can talk about the Arabian Sea as well. But, you know, starting with Iran, for, for, for all the opportunity it represents, and I think it does, I mean, if the JCPO a is back in play and countries are allowed to trade with Iran, one of the big beneficiaries of that is going to be Pakistan, if it allows itself to be, if, if it can manage the circumstances rather than becoming a victim to them. Iranian um, assertiveness or agency or, or hegemony is, is principally about Iran. It's, it's a Persian flex that has manifested itself throughout history. 
it now happens to be evangelically Shiite. But but that's not that's not. It, I know that for a lot of Pakistanis and Muslims in particular, that's the number one thing. I think it's more of Ajam. It's more of the of the Persian flex. But it's certainly a combination. And the downside of an engagement with Iran is an assumption that Iran will play on the sectarian divisions that exist within Pakistan. Uh, Shias and Sunnis are not the same. They have a different uh, approach to maybe the same faith. But on the extreme sides, neither the Shias nor the Sunnis actually accept that they are part of the same. So, the, and, and there are Pakistanis that have that view as well. Pakistan's job is to manage its internal sectarian divide so that it, its people don't become pawns or tools for other countries to use. Whether that's, uh, you know, countries from other countries from the Gulf or it's uh, Iran. And so I think the question there is, okay, can Pakistan be a catalyst if it's too busy firefighting its own sectarian challenges? So that's a question Pakistan has to answer. I think in recent years, we've seen, last six or seven years in particular, we've seen a clear indication that the Pakistani state understands what's at stake. The sectarian divide is one of the defining divides in Pakistan. If it's allowed to fester and blow up, it will make Pakistan untenable as a society. And so there has been a big push to shut down um, some of the more extreme groups. And, and we've seen uh, progress on that front, but it's not good enough. Every few months we have another attack on, uh, you know, ethnically, vis visibly ethnically different uh, Shias um, and, and Shias in general are on the defensive in, in Pakistan. And and again, I think that elements within the Iranian state uh, love that. They, they love the ability to come to the rescue of Pakistan's Shias. As long as that dynamic is at play, Pakistan's relationship with Iran is going to be tenuous at best. Afghanistan. The Afghan elite have never accepted Pakistan as a, as a sovereign nation because they have a contest with Pakistan on on the ethnic front, and, and they believe all Pakhtuns are one. This is some Afghan elite, not everybody. Uh, most Afghan elites accept, uh, they won't do it publicly, but they accept the, the Duran sort of uh, compact and, and the fact that Pakistan is uh, you know, an independent uh, sovereign nation. Um, and what those elites really want from Pakistan is for Pakistan to not play a negative role in the internal dynamic within Afghanistan. Pakistan's elites have the mirror uh, problem. They believe that without having some influence in Afghanistan, Afghanistan would go back to uh, type. And Afghanistan type is the unacceptance of, of Pakistani sovereignty. How do we resolve this? Well, the, I said earlier, the most important country on the planet for Pakistan is Afghanistan. If you don't resolve it, the 40 years that we've seen since the late 70s to now, we're gonna, we're just going to keep seeing more of this. It's, it's not going to change. But if we do resolve it, there is no force multiplier for Pakistani goodness on the planet than the Afghan people. Uh, this is Pakistan is the country where uh, upwards of 7 million Afghans made their home in, across various rounds of this conflict that's still ongoing. Even today, Upwards of two and a half million Afghans uh, live in Pakistan. And for all intents and purposes, at least a million and a half of them, uh, not only they were born and raised in Pakistan, but their parents spent most of their life in Pakistan. Because these are families that moved as, migra as, as refugees in, in 1978, 79, 80, and uh, 81. Resolving the, this ethnic challenge and finding a way to not be uh, reactive and defensive when a group like the Bakhtun uh, Tahafuz movement stands up and says, uh, stop putting roadblocks on our way home, stop treating us like second-rate citizens, stop uh, stop evading the question of missing people, that, that those challenges that the PTM or, or groups like that pose to the Pakistani state need to be dealt with in a way that is internal and coherent and not a way that pushes the BTM out to further outside the periphery of the Pakistani mainstream. 
That's 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 a challenge for the Pakistani state to figure out. With China, as I said earlier, the, the China is the one partner Pakistan has had that A doesn't believe in publicly shaming Pakistan and B has done nothing that is damaging to Pakistan's internal coherence. Of course, as I said earlier, China has some internal challenges that will eventually pose, uh, I think, uh, you know, a big set of questions for Pakistan. And I think the way in which the U.S. has doubled down, the U.S. and, 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 and wider Europe, on, on the question of Xinjiang is, is one of those challenges. But it's not a central challenge. And it's not going to undermine the core uh, relationship that the Pakistani and Chinese state have with each other. I think where Pakistan needs to do a lot more work is in engaging with ordinary Chinese people who are consumers of goods and services, because that's where the big economic opportunity vis-a-vis -vis China actually lies. Yes, CPEC has been a boon uh, for the infrastructure needs of the country, and I think it'll continue to be the, the Chinese public sector companies, private sector companies, them coming in and investing in Pakistan is great, but really, Pakistani businesses need to be able to sell their goods and services in mainland China, in Beijing, in Shanghai, in Guangzhou. And we see some of that, but not nearly enough for Pakistani strategists to be convinced and to, to feel any sort of complacency. And finally, with India, that's the one relationship in which really a change needs to occur in, in India for, for that relationship to work. And that change is an altering of the path that they're on vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir, the attempt to change the demography uh, of Kashmir, the attempt to demonize and, and uh, you know, tar and feather Muslims in general, but particularly Kashmiris, those are non-starters as far as a deeper engagement. If Kashmir gets settled, I think the potential for the India-Pakistan partnership is limitless. Uh, there's so much there's so many um, synergies. And, and if there was one sort of Lego country in terms of just the Punjab alone and, and what exists on both sides of the, of the Punjab or the Radcliffe line, if you will, I think lots of economic potential, huge already India enjoys massive cultural uh, you know, salience in Pakistan. Why shouldn't India take advantage of it? And why should India insist on continuing to brutally occupy, occupy uh, you know, the Kashmir Valley, when, when the people of that valley have rejected that occupation every single moment of, of, of that occupation, 72 years and going, and, it, you know, it's not resolved. I'm going to build off of the, the relationship with India a bit more, because as always, occasionally, you get a lot of chatter about backdoor discussions happening uh, how India signaled willingness to, you know, go to the table uh, to at least have open discussions without conditions. And I understand when you were a principal advisor at the foreign ministry, of course, there was talks uh, with India on the table as well. And it's kind of a two-part question because for Pakistan, uh, two relationships that certainly uh, Define, they don't necessarily define their geopolitics in the region. But they certainly affect uh, their geopolitical behavior and how they interact with regional partners. It's the relationship with India and it's the relationship with the United States. Uh, both relationships, of course, that uh, lack a lot of trust uh, and uh, lack some goodwill. But at the same time, there are shared interests. And like you said, sometimes all it needs is a key to unlock unlimited possibilities. And right now, and it goes back to your previous point as well about how this is about agency, the mediation efforts. It's not necessarily about just raw ambition. It's about agency and it's trying to navigate a region and take, uh, you know, define certain conflicts so then you can unlock or Pakistan can unlock opportunities for itself. And certainly those opportunities exist with the United States and they exist with India. Uh, so the first part of the question is, do you think the conditions are there, uh, you know, for at least talks with India, um, you know, starting with Kashmir, but of course it could talk about the nuclearization of the, uh, you know, of maritime waters, freedom of navigation. Um, you know, where does the, going back to the quad, where does the quad fit in this? Uh, what about tensions with, uh, with China? All of that, you know, all of that can be packed into discussions with India, but are the political conditions 
do they exist right now uh, within Pakistan? Or, and do you think, do they exist within India? And then the second question, of course, is now, how does the how does Pakistan rebuild that same level of trust with the United States? Uh, in you know 2018, the relationship took a dip, but of course, with U.S. Taliban discussions, it has uh, you know gradually increased, and Pakistan has been seen as a key partner uh, within the, that framework of those discussions. But how does Pakistan build upon that, and not only convince the United States that uh, you know they are a partner within the context of South Asia, but also a partner in you know ensuring freedom of navigation in uh, you know, working uh, with different ways to interact with different partners in the region, trade, all of that. Uh, so how do they, how, how can Pakistan build trust on both of those two different levels? I'm going to start with the U.S. because it's a quicker, mm -hmm. it's a quicker one. Um, I don't think it's for Pakistan to demonstrate anything really to the U.S. I think Pakistan, the U.S. has not had a partner of the quality and depth of Pakistan. Um, a country that is willing to take on what it's taken on um, for the sake of that partnership. And and I think some of the rhetoric that we've seen, and it's mostly subtle, uh, you know, we haven't really seen the Biden administration come out with anything dramatic, but just the kind of signals that we're getting. I, I think that this is going to run into, they're going to they're gonna run into a, a problem in Pakistan because, um, you know, at uh, at the Bad Lab, just recently, we we published uh, you know a full exploration of the range of drivers for the relationship, um, and I think the reaction both in Washington and in Islamabad was there was a lot of openness to all seven of the drivers that we'd identified and and the ways in which we proposed pursuing those drivers. Um, Again, I can't quite tell whether it's because so much of the Biden administration's focus has been domestic, so it you know hasn't gone around to it, and yet we see plenty of sort of you know uh, action on some foreign policy priorities that the U.S. has. I think the question of the Quad really isn't isn't a question for Pakistan. Pakistan's not part of the Quad. It's not going to be part of the Quad. Pakistan's not going to stand in the way of anything that the U.S. wants to do in terms of, you know, the Arabian Sea. It's also not going to do anything inimical to the interests of China. So that would be Pakistan's policy in the Quad. As far as uh, building trust with the U.S., I think, again, I think the question is, what can the U.S. do to demonstrate that it doesn't see Pakistan as a single window for Afghan ops? And that it sees Pakistan differently. Again, I think as far as the agency is concerned, it is Pakistani agency to determine and develop the avenues where it is important for the U.S. in other areas. And right now, it frankly isn't. Uh, the quantum of trade isn't high enough. Um, but 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 I do think that the demography of Pakistan is relatively unique, and and does offer opportunities for. American strategists to think more deeply about, you know, the footprint that the U.S. wants to have and the influence it wants to have on a democracy of this nature. At the end of the day, though, I think more of the onus lies in the U.S. than on Pakistan. I think as a partner, I'll say again, I don't think you get the quality of partner that, that you've had with Pakistan over the last two decades anywhere on the planet. And, and I think that Americans do have to consider that what they ask of Pakistan often, and I'll segue into India, what they ask of Pakistan often is for Pakistan to kind of, oh, just forget about your whole thing with India. Why don't we just do this? No, our whole thing with India, Pakistan's whole thing with India is existential. It's definitional. It's structural. It can't be wished away. It can't be bought away. It can't be negotiated away. So specifically to the Bajwa doctrine and what Prime Minister Khan and General Bajwa have attempted to do. What they've attempted to do since before Prime Minister Khan became Prime Minister, you saw public statements of um, openness to talks. Uh, General Bajwa dialing down uh, the heat on the LOC in advance of the elections. You saw right after the elections an invitation to the Indians to, to come to Pakistan for the swearing in. You saw Later in November that year, the opening of the Kartarpur Corridor to enable Indian pilgrims to come and visit holy places in Pakistan. Then you saw in February 2019, the um, 
Pulwama attack, which India blamed on Pakistan, although if there was enough evidence for it, more would have been said by, by Western powers, and there wasn't. Um, not only the blame, but then the Balakot attack in which Indian planes dropped bombs on Pakistani territory for the first time in 50 years. Um, it was an escalation of the sort we haven't seen between two nuclear neighbors since at least Kargil, um, which is which is 20 years ago. And in every one of those instances, everything that Pakistan did was conciliatory. Its response bombing was on an open space, deliberately demonstrating that Pakistan had capacity but no will to escalate. Um, number two, handing back a captured pilot within a day and a half of having captured him, demonstrating again capacity but no will to escalate. And then with the prime minister coming on national television and making a conciliatory speech, even though Pakistan was the country that had been attacked. So again, every step of the way, following that in August 2019, the annexation, the illegal annexation of occupied Kashmir, um, again, the reaction was pulling the high commissioner back, stopping any talks uh, to do with the trade and essentially saying, we can't even talk to you, even though we've made all these attempts to reach out to you. If all of our gestures are rewarded with this kind of ultimate aggression, which is what, you know, the annexation of occupied Kashmir is. Since then, despite domestic pressure, every rhetorical flourish has been about making peace, settling the conflict, resolving the Kashmir issue, and even the exposure and, and the news of this back channel that's been ongoing since 2018. Um, even throughout this, everything you've seen, including at the Islamabad security dialogue, is conciliatory. Now, in response to all of these measures, so, so the question of, is the Pakistani domestic politics ready for peace with India? Ready? <laughs> I mean, a red carpet showered with rose petals and sprayed with whatever perfume is, is, is the hottest one these days. Um, what, more, uh, what more can Pakistan do? I, I can tell you the answer. If you ask friends from, you know, that, that have a sympathetic view of the Indian state, um, and this is not restricted to the BJP, this is Congress BJP, this is the Indian establishment really, the response is stop talking about Kashmir. Stop calling it occupied. Basically, make Kashmir go away. Also, make any manifestations of Kashmir being a problem go away. And then we can talk. Now, General Bajwa is actually, from, from, from my, my sort of, you know, reading of the situation, I think General Bajwa and Prime Minister Khan are willing to go quite a long way. But they, they cannot because it defies the laws of physics and gravity for Pakistan to be able to go that far of that way. And so the other bit of the answer is, yes, Pakistan has laid out the red carpet and has done everything right as far as India is concerned since 2018. But Pakistan has also done the same thing for the three years preceding that and the three years preceding that. Whether it was Nawaz Sharif, uh, who, was, who was tarred and feathered for seeking peace with India, or it's General Bajwa, who eventually will be tarred and feathered for seeking peace with India, or it's Prime Minister Khan, who also will be eventually tarred and feathered for seeking peace with India. The fact that Pakistani leaders risk this level of being tarred and feathered to continue to seek peace with India says something about the strategic consensus in Pakistan. And the consensus is Kashmir will never not be an issue but even as it's an issue, Pakistan is willing to sort out the wider array of things that can make the relationship at least functional again and reduce the chances of a conflict which has the closest chance on the planet of becoming a nuclear conflict. So in order to stave off potential war that could become catastrophic war, Pakistan is willing to bend over backwards and is currently bending over backwards. Now, at the end of that, if the response by the Indians is not good enough, then what India is really saying is Pakistan has to embrace Indian regional hegemony. And I can tell you this, and I'm happy to talk about it till the cows come home, not going to happen. 
let me push back on that just a bit. Sure. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for going into those details. So let's walk ourselves back a little uh, to, let's say, uh, the late 2000s and the early 2010s. At least until then, uh, there were Pakistan-based actors staging terrorist attacks in India. Uh, and, of course, that uh, cycle has subsided gradually. But it's created a, a mistrust on the part of the Indians. So I get you that there are political imperatives, ideology uh, in New Delhi with the new government. And I'll also accept your argument that uh, whether it's BJP or Congress, they just want you to stop talking about Kashmir. I get that. But then they do, uh, they also want to be able to have a negotiation. Well, that's a maximalist position. There's also a desire for negotiation. One of the things from an Indian point of view, if you do empathetic analysis, is that, uh, you know, time and again, whatever the dynamics, internal dynamics, and this probably is a good place to segue into domestic politics in Pakistan, especially the civil military relations aspect, is that, you know, there have been so many occasions where we thought we'd put the past behind, but then something else happened. So you have, uh, you know, after uh, you thought Cargill was over, then you had the attack uh, in the, uh, on the Indian parliament, you had the attack on the Kashmiri legislature that led to a major standoff and the U.S. had to mediate and pull back really shortly after 9-11 while the U.S. was dealing with Afghanistan. Uh, th then you start a new dialogue. Uh, you know, Agra, Musharraf goes to Agra to meet uh, the, his Indian counterparts. We start, it doesn't go too far, but then finally the ice breaks. And 2004, you have, you know, Vajpayee, in earnest starting again. And that process leads to a flowering of people to people relationships. And I still remember, you know, uh, there was a lot of activity, cross border activity, where civil society from both sides was embracing the other, even though the state was sort of dragging its feet on both sides. Uh, but then 2008 happens, Mumbai attacks. Uh, and then you, the, again, you have a situation where the US has to come in and mediate and say, okay, don't go to war. Uh, and let's pull back from this brink. And then you continue on, and eventually you come to a BJP government that uh, whose politics is now defined in anti, being anti-Pakistani. So for, there is an internal struggle in India between debate between those who say, okay, let's call them hawks and doves, okay? So there are the hawks who say, hey, no, you know, we had subscribe to the BJP ideology, and this we're not doing any of this. And so Pakistan is the one that has to concede. Then there are those who say, no, we need to be able to be more reasonable, but they get shut down because of this entire past. How do you address it from an Indian perspective where there's a lack of trust uh, or just lack of trust going into a lack of willingness? So, I mean, I'll say that, uh, you know, Baruch Hashem, you know, there's no, there's no lack of Indian viewpoints, right? Uh, so, so from the, I, I, I'm not, I'm not able to, you know, address anything from the Indian standpoint. But I can respond to that array of issues uh, from a Pakistani standpoint because I'm on the record as doing this. I mean, I thought Mumbai was an attack on all of South Asia. I, I think the Mumbai attacks were one of the most horrific things that have ever happened to the South Asian people, because it firmly put a permanent dent in the ability of the ordinary Indian to imagine a non-villainous Pakistani. Mumbai was one of the worst things that ever happened to the entire region, ever. So, so that that's my view on a Mumbai. Um, but a, an Indian Navy captain named Kulbushan Yadav was captured in Pakistan. What was he doing there? He was conducting and, and managing terrorist operations on behalf of the Indian state in Pakistan. Again, this is unpopular and difficult for, for American audiences to, uh, to hear. Nobody really wants to hear about Pakistan's complaints. A train full of Pakistanis, call, and the train was called Samjota Express. 
Samjota meaning agreement, compromise. peace accord, compromise. The Samjota Express terrorist attack in India by Indian terrorists killed. Do you remember how many Pakistanis were killed in the Samjota Express? Everybody remembers how many Indians were killed in Mumbai. And, and, and Pakistani writers like myself have written in the Indian press of how horrific that was, have demanded accountability, have demanded that the organizations that were running free to conduct those kinds of operations be shut down. But today, those organizations have been shut down. I think that if we start tearing away at the history, you know, it's a thread that will never end. I, I mean, the Indian thread goes back all the way to Mahmoud of Ghaznavi. I, I wasn't even born in 1971. I can't even be accountable for 71. I can demand that my country apologize to Bangladesh. Similarly, I can demand that the founders and, and the drivers of the LET and the Jesh Muhammad be shut down. And, and they have been. So now that they've been shut down, who do we talk to? And there's nobody to talk to in India, like, like you said. There's, there's really no consensus. Does that mean that Indian uh, positions don't have any grounding, don't have any basis? Of course they do. I mean, you mentioned Mumbai and everything before Mumbai. I mean, even after Mumbai, there's things that have happened. And some of them, Pakistanis would argue, uh, you know, could be false flag, could be, you know, things that are happening that are internal to India. But the fact that they can be blamed on Pakistan is for Pakistani agency to address. But my response to that is it has addressed them. Now, somebody might say, well, it's recent, so we have to wait and see. Okay, wait and see. But if in the bargain... Every offer to negotiate, mediate, discuss, facilitate some sort of a settlement is responded to with history. Then Pakistanis have plenty of things from a history perspective that they can throw into the mix too. And I think that the first principle of building peace and ending conflict is to start with the now. So starting now, the orchard of olive trees and branches has been thrown at the feet of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Let's see where this goes. I think this has potential, but I also think that if the expectation is that unmitigated compromise is for Pakistan to make and unmitigated violations of the spirit of peace and conflict uh, resolution is for India to, to sort of, you know, um, for Indian agency to choose to do what it wants with it, then the long-term sustainability of this is, is it's a non-starter. It may last as long as, you know, the current dispensation lasts. But for durable peace in South Asia, for durable prosperity in South Asia, for the people of India, the biggest country in the region, and the one that actually has the most complex problems, for the people of India to be happier and better off and more, and, and more at peace with themselves and with their partners in the region, including potentially Pakistan, the principal driver of that process has to be New Delhi. And as a Pakistani from a country that has thrown the olive tree and olive branch orchard at India's feet, I, I'm not particularly hopeful that that's going to happen. I, I hope that's not too morose. No, it's not. It's not. And, and, but go on, develop that at, at the domestic level where uh, you did say that there is a consensus, but there is a dysfunctionality within the Pakistani state that hampers foreign policy and domestic policy, quite frankly. And tell us, tell us where that process is. Uh, you know, we, we have decades of history that we can unpack, but tell us where it is right now and where do you see it going? Uh, you know, civil military relations uh, is never a dull moment in Pakistan. Uh, and this one seems to be a pretty interesting moment. It, it is. I think over the last two and a half years, what we've tried in Pakistan is, um, and I don't think we've tried as a process of any kind of consensus, I think what's been foisted uh, partly, I, I mean, partly that's unfair. Imran Khan is, I think, today, possibly the, you know, he, he may be among the most popular and maybe the most popular individual leader. But does he hold the, the, the aspirations and the excitement of the majority of Pakistanis? I think that uh, absolutely not. But, but I think nobody does. Um, we have four or five um, leaders or centers of power that, uh, that stimulate the imagination of different Pakistanis. And so this idea of consensus is really an interesting one in Pakistan because 
to develop that consensus requires the coming together of these four or five leaders. Now, who are those leaders? Uh, to my mind, um, Imran Khan is right up there. Nawaz Sharif uh, and increasingly his daughter, Mariam Nawaz Sharif, are right up there. Pr uh, former President Asif Ali Zardari and his son, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, are right up there. Um, the army chief and the institution of the army in terms of the political imagination of the people, as dysfunctional as it may seem, but that they are legitimately, not constitutionally, but in terms of actual popularity, they are, they are up there. And then there's a compendium of what you might call right-wingers that are up there. One of them recently passed away. His name is Khadim Hussain Rizvi. Um, there are others that will replace him. His son has replaced him. But there are other parties within the right wing, within the expanse of right wing groups that are there. They've always been dismissed uh, by people like me and, and including by me as never having performed at the ballot box. But in the 2018 election, even there, their performance was very, very strong. Uh, they didn't win a lot of seats. But in a lot of seats, they were the second or third runner-ups with substantial numbers of votes. So there are real Pakistani sisters and brothers of mine who vote for these people. And, and so I can't just wish them away. Uh, finally, there's a group of ethnic uh, or sub-nationalist uh, representatives that have captured the imagination of small pockets of people. I mentioned the PTM. Uh, in terms of Pakhtun, young Pakhtuns, especially from the tribal areas, they're very excited by this group. Uh, there are the Baloch uh, nationalists, and they they align with various groups, and there's a spectrum of Baloch sentiment in Pakistan. The extreme one um, is, is you know, is in a fight with the Pakistani state. Um, that That's something that Pakistani consensus builders have to contend with. So for me to pretend that this is just the army chief versus Nawaz Sharif actually is a great injustice to the voices, sentiments, and lives of people in Balochistan who feel a certain way about Pakistan, for people in the tribal areas who feel a certain way. And, and there are other discontents. I think the MQM is the big ignored sort of, you know, um, injured or wounded elephant that, you know, may be healed and start trampling about once again, God knows when. So I think the urban center, Karachi, a city of 20 plus million, really its fortunes are, even today, informed by what the fate of the MQM will be. And we, we don't know what it'll be, but that's another ethnic or ethnically driven group that uh, that needs to be considered. And then there's pockets of, you know, resistance to the overarching um, or, or dominant narrative in, in the country. D to my mind, some of the most exciting young leaders in Pakistan are some of its feminists. Um, you know, the Audit March uh, group, you know, has done some incredible things. They, again, they've challenged patriarchy in a way that that patriarchy has woken up and is pushing back by, you know, by hook and by crook. Um, I think some of the leftist leaders in the country, again, young people, and again, they can be tarred and feathered in various ways as well, but I think they're extremely brave and they add a really rich, uh, new sort of strain within the Pakistani political discourse. So... Political consensus is about bringing all of these people into one tent and then defining the air in that tent in a certain way, extracting it, putting it in a bottle or multiple bottles, and then taking it out to India, to Afghanistan, to China, to Iran, and to the Arabian Sea and saying, this is Pakistan, this is what the offer is. Mm -hmm. And so what I think is in that bottle right now, even though not everybody in that tent is on board but what is in that bottle right now is a focus on growing the pakistani economy and not being distracted by large or small conflicts so china versus us hey man go at it we we at some level we don't care as long as it doesn't hurt us you can call each other call them wolves call call the americans what you know whatever they call the americans we don't care and actually, I don't think either the Chinese or the Americans care whether we care or not either, because Pakistan is not big enough to to matter that much that we would be, you know, a, an object of the strategic attention of either country to that extent. And that's probably good for Pakistan. So as long as we can do free trade with China, free trade with the United States, as long as American venture capitalists are coming and investing in Pakistani startups and Chinese companies are laying fiber, and American companies are coming and setting up towers, and Chinese companies are coming and laying roads, you know, put all that together, 
Pakistanis get to build on that infrastructure, the software and the hardware of economic activity and grow as, a, as an economy. Once Pakistan grows, it'll be an advantage to both countries. So I think that's, that's really potentially the offer. And the thing that, you know, I, I know you want me to go deeper in the domestic and, and, I, and I'm happy to do that. But within the domestic, I think eventually any serious conversation uh, that seeks to build that kind of reform needs to address Pakistan's economic potential. It, it goes back to a, an argument that you made in December about uh, Pakistan passing the Rubicon, which I found a really interesting language to use, where consensus is that key element. But, you know, I would love to talk more about this, but we uh, are five minutes over time. Uh, this was such a great discussion. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and I learned quite a lot about Pakistan's individual agency, its imperatives, its constraints, how it relates to the greater geopolitical and security landscape of the region. And I hope our enjoyers, uh, our, I, I, I hope our uh, viewers enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, we encourage everyone to watch this on YouTube. If you didn't get the whole clip, uh, we have recorded it on our YouTube website. Uh, you can also check out New Lines Institute out on its website, newlinesinstitute.org. Uh, you can learn a bit more about the Strategic Backings Program, our human security uh, unit, and our think tank in general. Thank you once again for uh, joining us. I hope everyone has a very safe, healthy rest of their week. Uh, and thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Caroline. Thank you, Kamran. Thank you. Thanks.